In this video, I'm going to be sharing words and phrases that start with the letter R from the Appalachian region. For reference, I'm going to be using the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English. So the very first, first entry for the letter, letter R is rabbit fever. I've never known anyone that had rabbit fever, but I've heard about it my whole life. So it's a noun, and it's, it's actually T-U-L-A-R-E-M-I-A -E is what it is, but rabbit fever is the common name for it. So 1992, Bush, Dory, people were dying from something called rabbit fever. 1997, Montgomery Collection, an infection carried by the larva of a fly that burrows inside the skin of a rabbit, meaning that the animal should not be eaten from April to September during the life cycle of the larva. And that was submitted by Cardwell. Rabbit tobacco is the next one. I bet a lot of you have heard of that. So it's a noun, the catfoot plant, and then it's got the Latin name that I won't even try to, try to read. Sometimes smoked by children in imitation of adults smoking tobacco. Same as cudweed, old field balsam, poverty weed, sweet balsam, sweet everlasting, and tobacco weed. Well, today, not many people smoke cigarettes. Not many people use tobacco like they did in the, in the old days, probably when the, uh, these quotes from the dictionary, cigarettes would have been more popular. And therefore, because they were, children were more interested in imitating uh, adults who were smoking. So 1982, Stubka, wildflowers. It is sometimes called poverty weed and old field balsam and old field balsam because it thrives in dry areas and waste places. Names such as sweet balsam and sweet everlasting refer to its fragrance. Other names are rabbit tobacco and cudweed. 1992, Bush, another Dory reference. My cousin smoked rabbit tobacco, a green gray plant that grew around the barn. So you'll often hear, hear older people here in my area of Appalachia talk about uh, either trying to smoke rabbit tobacco when they were small or someone that they knew did. Granny's even got a story about some of her cousins uh, trying to smoke it. And Granny was way too, uh, too afraid, so she ran off and left them. She didn't want to get in trouble for doing something she wasn't supposed to do. The next one is race, R-A-C-E, and it's a noun, a ditch or runway to carry water to a mill wheel operated by gravity, a mill stream, same as a mill race. 1975, Lunsford, it used to be, in all this country, there's old mill sites and dam sites where they had at one time the creek dammed up and the water ran around in a race some little distance from the creek. 1995, Mingus, mill, from here on upstream, the ground is fairly level, so a simple ditch or race is sufficient to carry the water. The walls of the race are lined with boards to keep them from eroding away. So I've never really seen a, a race like that. It always reminds me when I hear about them, though, of water slides. I used to like to ride water slides when I was young. Uh, I have a video, though, where Don Cassida shows me where an old... Um, he doesn't really call it a race, but where a waterway was built, and it was primarily not talking about milling corn or something like that. It was for logging, so to push the logs down. Um, I'll link to that, though, if you've never seen it. Of course, all traces of it are gone, and I would never know what it was, but somebody like uh, Don, who is a great historian when it comes to the Smoky Mountains, the best I know, actually, um, he's researched and studied and interviewed people, and so he just has a wealth of information, so that's how he knows uh, where it was at. And then once you know the area, then you can begin to see the, you can figure it out, the indention. Kind of like in the area I live in, you can often see, um, if you're paying attention, you can see the, the signs of old roads. Even sometimes the roadbed might have a tree or something growing in it. But if you're, you're looking and paying attention, you can see that it was at one time used by either wagons or maybe, like in my area, immediate area here, even by cars. The next one is a racket, racket. And see, that one's one that I think would be common anywhere, but that's something very common in my area that someone would say if it's a noise, quit making that racket, or what's that racket? I heard a racket outside and I don't know what it is. So that's just like one of the words that immediately would come out of my mouth. Matt, I heard a racket in the basement and would you go down there and see what it is? Or, you know, something's making a funny racket in my washing machine, I'm afraid it's about to tear up. So that one's just beyond common to me, uh, and I'm curious if it is in other places. 
So racket is a noun and altercation sometimes with physical contact, a noisy fight. So hmm, they're saying it's more a fight than just a noise like I would be more familiar with. Let's see if we can find one. 1950, Roman Mountain. I am a Scotsman when I have to spend money on a bird that likes to have a racket with me every day. I don't even know exactly what that one means. 1975, Jackson, unusual words. A racket implies more actual contact, whereas ruckus or rucus, fraction and fray all mean a fist fight or a gun fight. 1997, Montgomery Collection. It was known to 10 consultants. And then it's got like blow, violent stroke, racket, thump, blow. So I don't know, it's interesting. They're, they're more thinking of it. I mean, the dictionary is more uh, pointing it in the direction of a fight. Maybe that's the part that's fell out of fashion and the noise part is still just really common. Raft, this is an interesting one. I've, I'm not familiar with it at all. Raft is a noun, an abundance or collection, especially of children. 1926, Wilson, Cullowee, word list, equals abundance. A raft is an abundance. There was a raft of children at play, so I've never heard that one. I'll be, I've heard raft, of course, but not in relation to meaning abundance. I'll be interested to see if you're familiar with it. Raggedy, which just means ragged. That one, again, is beyond common. If you watch my videos often, I bet at some point you've heard me say something is raggedy. It looks raggedy. Uh, that's one I say. 1969, Miller, Raisin Tobacco. Raggedy lugs, the bottommost leaves, thinner in texture and less gummy, were so called because of their ragged appearance since the leaves began ripening in the field at the bottom up. 1997, Nelson, Country Folklore. When we got there, we were raggedy and dirty from riding in the boxcars. So raggedy. Also say jaggedy. That's another one if something is jaggedy. It's jaggedy. Be careful. You might get, uh, it might cut you. Be careful. This one doesn't really have a, it's telling us to look in a different place for regular, but raggler. So Pap said regular like that, raggler. Just get some raggler gas and it'll be good. Or some, you know, I just like the raggler kind, not the, not the, uh, whatever sp special kind he might have been talking about. So that's just regular. It's just a different way of pronouncing it. Raid is a verb to seek and destroy an illegal steal. 1962 Hall Collection, Hartford, Tennessee. Joe Ray, deputy sheriff for Boyce Hardwood Company, was raiding someone making liquor over on Hurricane Creek. 1973, this was from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I've raided more stills in them old mountains there and in Sevier County, I cut every old bootleg around there on Fighting Creek everywhere. So that, that was somebody doing the raiding that was uh, talking about that. The next one is rail, a noun, a rough board split from a log used in making fences, pins, etc. Hence, a rail fence is a fence made of overlapping horizontal wooden boards split from logs. It is often laid in zigzag fashion, in which case it is also known as a snake fence, worm fence, or a zigzag fence, but sometimes straight with vertical posts to join the rails, known as a post and rail or post and rider fence. Both types occur in the Smokies. So I'm sure you've seen those uh, split rail fence that are zigzagging, kind of do look like they zigzag across as they go around something, around a field. 1949, Curith, Word Geography, East. Rail fence is also widely current in West Virginia and is in regular use in the mountains farther south. 1953 Hall Collection, Bryson City, North Carolina. The place was fenced with black walnut rails used for making gun stocks. That was Granville Calhoun. 1956 Hall Collection, Roaring Fork, Tennessee. At that time, we had what we called a fence law. They'd split rails, they'd split rails and build rail fences to protect their crops. The law was to build it five rails high and if the cow brute broke over that, the owner of the brute had to pay the damage. So five rails high, I guess would be a pretty, pretty tall fence, at least tall enough to keep the cows out. A rail house is a noun, a small house for loggers, transportable by rail from one encampment to another. That reminds me of, um, 
the book Dory that we read and we've done in kind of the books done in dictionaries done and uh, used it as reference twice here but if you remember if you listen to Dory her family would be lived in those houses when her husband was logging in the mountains in the Smoky Mountains I'll link to that in case you missed Dory Woman of the Mountains it is a fantastic book Rail Pen kind of goes along with what we were just reading is an enclosure for animals or for storing crops constructed of rails Rainbird or rain crow I bet you've heard that rain raven I've never heard that one the yellow-billed cuckoo so called because of the cry it makes in lowering weather thus pretending the onset of rain I wonder I think I've also heard uh, I've heard something else called a rain crow besides a cuckoo it's not a cuckoo 1939 Hall Collection, White Oak, North Carolina. Rain crows, when you hear them, holler, it's going to rain. And that was Carl Masser. 1966 to 68, Rain Bird equals Cuckoo, Brasstown, North Carolina, Spruce Pine, North Carolina. Rain crow, rain raven, a water bird that makes a booming sound before rain and often stands with its beak almost straight up. And that was Cherokee, North Carolina. So I've apparently just not heard that not I don't know exactly what they're talking about rain bullfrogs I guess if the uh, rain crow if you hear it then it may rain bullfrogs after that which just means uh, to rain very hard I've heard a lot of rain say sayings like you know it's gonna um, a gully washer all those kind of things I have a video about words like that to describe rain too but I've never heard it, it's gonna rain bullfrogs or that it rained bullfrogs that's an interesting one and that was from Maryville, Tennessee. It's where the, uh, it was known to Adams, Brown, Cardwell, Jones, Shields, and Weaver. That's interesting. I like this next one a lot, and it's another one that's just so common, um, and I'm sure you've heard it, and I'm sure that you're familiar with it too, but to ra raise, raise up, verb phrase, to grow up, hence raising, raising up, one's childhood, upbringing, manners, uh, thus, you could be above your raisin, you know, if you were conceited or stuck up. 1924, spring, Lydia Whaley. Never heard anyone swear except off in my raisin. 1937, Hall Collection, Mingus Creek. In my raisin up, two or three besides your own family would set up with sick people. Martha Jane Crisp is who said that. 1956, Hall Collection, Newport, Tennessee. Mr. Barnes lived in... North Carolina and raised up there. Let's see, let's skip all the way to 1994, Montgomery Collection. When I raised up, we didn't do that. I don't know what they were talking about. So interesting. I still say that today. If somebody says, where are you from? Are you, have you always lived in Brasstown? I will say, yeah, born and raised, born and raised in Brasstown. Uh, I was actually born in Copper Hill, but then I come back to Brasstown. Uh, but anyway, I still would say that raised. Where were you raised at? Matt was raised in Haywood County, I would tell somebody that. Matt was raised in the Dutch Cove in Haywood County. So that one's still really, really common here. You can let me know if it is where, where you're at, too. And going right along with that one, you might have heard when you were growing up, somebody asked you if you were raised in a barn because you tracked in mud or maybe you left the door open or something like that. So that one's pretty, pretty common. Raised in a barn is just means uncouth, lacking manners or social training. Raise one's meat. If you raise one's meat, if you raise meat yourself, that just means same thing as we would say we raise a garden every year. So if we were somebody that had, we raised hogs or we raised chickens for meat. Um, or raise sheep or anything like that. Maybe you raise beef even. So that one's pretty. I think that one would be common um, across America for sure. This next one's kind of interesting. It's just rake, R-A-K-E, but it's used. Uh, it's talking about, it, you would use it just like you think you, what immediately comes to mind when you think about raking the leaves or raking the grass or something. But it's just talking about the variant forms that you might hear, past tense. You might hear roke ruck or rucked i've not really heard any of those um, 1936 we've ruck over huggins hell for your carcass and here you turn up as lively and as ornery as you ever was um, that was from mass tall tale so they had ruck over they'd raked up we would say they raked over um, 
looking, they, he must have been lost or something and they were looking for him and then there he turned up. They maybe had given him up for dead and he still turned up. Uh, uh, kind of going along with that one but used in a different way and I've never heard this is rake out. So that just means to start or leave. 1939 Hall Collection, Proctor, North Carolina. We just go over to the Hall Cabin on top of Smokey and stay like we was staying at home. And we'd rake out next morning after them bear. So they'd went over there to go bear hunting and then they'd rake out where we just say we got up early or took off or I don't know, I've not heard that one. The next one is interesting, uh, very common to me. And I have another, I have a video about this one too. So I linked it if you've not heard of it, but most of you probably have. And this is getting to the time of the year when you start thinking about them and it's ramp. So ramp is a noun, a wild leek, having a pungent taste and smell, considered a delicacy by some. It is celebrated each spring in the ramp festival held near Cosby. Tennessee. It is sometimes eaten for its tonic effect. There's lots of ramp festivals throughout Appalachia. 1913 Morley, Carolina Mountains. Although the Nantahalas abound in beautiful flowers, they also have a reputation for the production of ramps, as the people call the wild onions that are abundant enough in some regions to be a nuisance to the farmer. 1917 Cape Art, Rampion. The wild garlic of the mountains. So you can kind of see there, they've called it a leek, an onion, and a garlic. Now technically, I don't know what it is, but I would say the taste is similar to an onion and garlic, but different. You just have to taste one to actually, actually understand it. So you'll hear it called lots of different things. Let's see if we can find. 1977 Shields, Cades Cove. After a winter with only stored, dried, and canned vegetables and fruits, the fresh wild greens of the spring were a welcome change. These included the wild cresses of the fields, the bare lettuce of the mountain streams, the toothwort of the moist stream banks, and most abundant of all, the wild leek or ramp of the northern slopes. 1995 Williams, Smoky Mountains Folklife. While the consumption of wild greens has been common throughout much of the southern United States, the most quintessentially mountain of the items gathered from the wild is the ramps, which only grow at elevations of 3,000 feet or more. A wild leek ramps are gathered in late April or early May in moist, dark coves. They were also consumed as a spring tonic and were traditionally served with sassafras tea. Ramps are still eaten raw or parboiled and fried in grease frequently with scrambled eggs. So that part about them being only grow at high elevations, that's what I've always heard and always been told. So none grow right here around my house. But uh, when I did my video about them and I, the one I said I'd link to, we went with a friend over on uh, near Standing Indian between here and Franklin, North Carolina. To, to dig ramps. I hope we can go back this year. It didn't work out last year, but I hope me and Matt can go this year. But um, a lot of people said, no, they grow at my house and it were below that elevation. So I'm not sure about that. Another thing, a lot of people said, well, why don't you, um, did you bring the roots back and uh, plant them? Or you could plant, you could, you know, a lot of people critiqued us about how we dug them, but we did bring the roots back home and plant them, but they didn't, they didn't take for us. They didn't grow. Now, Travis, the, our friend that went with us, he's dug them every year for, for years and years and years. And he said he had done that. And sometimes they do take, and sometimes they don't. He just wasn't sure about it. But over the years, he's developed kind of a patch at his house. And so, so then that kind of goes along with, he might be a little bit higher than we are right here. He lives more towards Hayesville. But that goes along with the, well, no, they would grow, you know, at lower elevations. Anyway, that's interesting. But ramps play a really huge role in the culture uh, of Southern Appalachia. You hear lots of stories every year about people that's like the celebrating time, kind of like uh, some of those entries were saying that it's, it's because it's the sign of, uh, you know, warm weather's coming, the hard winter's over, and then they're delicious to eat. But then you also hear funny stories about that they, you know, kind of like garlic and onions, they can leave you with a very pungent smell. So you'll hear some uh, heartwarming, you know, kind of funny, but heartwarming stories about kids eating them and getting hunt, sent home from school. You have to wonder if some of them didn't do that on purpose so they could get out of school but lots of memories uh, surrounded ramps for sure. Me and Matt love them. We love to eat them, not necessarily raw, and we they're okay in eggs, but our favorite way to eat them is in fried potatoes. They're so good, so good. They're also good in other things, but really good in fried taters if you're a fried tater fan. 
So the next one is ramshackledy. Kind of goes back to those um, the jaggedy that we read and um, what other was it that I I said? Oh, it was a raggedy, and I said jaggedy is it. But kind of putting that e that y on the end of it. We do that a lot in Appalachia. The same way we do with the est. We add est to a lot of words like fightingest or dancingest or singingest. But putting that y, um, that Y sound on the end is kind of just to put some more emphasis. So it wasn't just ramshackle, it was ramshackledy. It was even more. So that just is shaky and bad repair. Montgomery Collection, it was known to 10 consultants. That's really all they tell about that one in 1997. And that's still here, I would say, you know, you know down there by that little ramshackledy house that nobody lives in? Well, he lives just above that, just, just beyond that on that road. That's where he lives. The next one is Ram Studious. I've never really heard that one. I did, I think I give it to Corey and Katie in one of the tests that I give them, because I think where I heard it, uh, first was actually when I was in college and I took an Appalachian Studies class and we had vocabulary test and it was on one of them but in in real life I've never heard anyone say it and it means quarrelsome quarrelsome if you're ram studious you're quarrelsome and you're it's kind of like you got a chip on your shoulder and you just go around arguing with everybody and that was 1939 Hall Collection uh, in Gatlinburg Tennessee it was known by James West Whaley so that's an interesting one, even though I've not really, really heard it. Now this next one kind of goes along, if you're a Ram Studious person, then you might do this, is rare, R-A-R-E, rare, a verb, to become enraged, berate, call out loudly. 1922 Cape Art, our Southern Highlanders, why if there's liquor around and she don't get none, she just rares. So that was uh, someone that liked to drink. 1931, Goodrich Mountain Homespun, she'll be a raring and a raging. 1940, Hans Hawks Dunn, every time anybody get down, he would rare about them killing time. So today, I, I, I still hear that one, and you might hear like, um, you know, I go back to one I used a minute ago, like I tracked mud in and mama just rared me out. I, I should have known better than that. I should have took my shoes out. Or, you know, I was down at the store and somebody um, got in front of me and I pointed out that they shouldn't have got in front of me and they just rared me out. So you'll hear that kind of like what we would say also blessed you out or told you off. But so I still hear rared use like that. It'd be interesting to know if you're familiar with that one and really if you're familiar with any of these. So please do leave a comment and share which ones you were familiar with, which ones you had never heard of. And as always, I hope you drop back by often so we can um, celebrate Appalachia. But for me, I'm so plum crazy about our, I'm just plum foolish about it really, because I could just talk about it all day long, about the wonderful words and phrases that you find in Appalachia.